I like happy endings. Whether it's a story or a sporting event, real life or a movie, I like happy endings. And frankly, I think we like happy endings. They feel good, don't they? They make us feel good. Things seem to be going toward a happy ending in chapter 3 of Jonah. Jonah, when asked a second time to go and preach to Nineveh, did. I think any of us that would have experienced the ordeal of chapters 1 and 2 would have caused us to go preach to Nineveh, don't you think? The people of Nineveh repented. They responded in a positive way to Jonah's preaching. They believed God. They turned. And just when, they think, when you think they're setting you up for a happy ending, we have chapter 4. I mean, chapter 4 is one of the reasons that I believe that Jonah and the large fish and the Ninevites and everything else in that story are true. There's not a fairy tale ending. It's more like real life, isn't it? There are messes that are not cleaned up. There are emotions that are just kind of hanging out there. And the relationships are not packaged up neat and tidy. This morning we'll be taking our last look at the book of Jonah. In chapter 4, we'll see the real Jonah. His portrait is not airbrushed. It is not touched up in any way, but we'll see him for who he is. Emotions, questions, and frustrations. What we see is a prophet who cannot take his eyes off himself and his own ideas. And so this morning, we'll take a look at Jonah. We'll take a look at God. We'll see the scope of God's compassion. And if we dare, we can take a look at ourselves and, how, and see how we respond to God's compassion. So I invite you to turn with me to Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Listen to God's word. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life. For it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city where he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind. And the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, Have you been concerned about this? You have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Friends, this is God's Word, and God always blesses the reading and the hearing 
of the Scriptures. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight. For you are the rock and redeemer of our souls. And so, Lord, we ask that you would help us to hear your word afresh. But help us not only to hear it, but to meditate on it, to think about it, and to act upon it. For, Lord, we desire to be people who follow you. To that end, Lord, we ask that you might be glorified. For we ask it in the strong name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. What we see here is what I would call red-hot anger. This is Jonah's response to something that seemed very, very wrong. And what seemed wrong was what happened as a result of Jonah's preaching. You remember that eight-word sermon that he preached in chapter 3, right? Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That was it. That was it. And Nineveh repented. Jonah didn't like that. And in his own eyes, he had every right to be angry. I mean, he was a prophet. He was an ardent nationalist. The nation of Israel was God's chosen people. God's goodness was to be shown to the Israelites, not to the Gentiles, not to the Ninevites. No way. You see, the Ninevites were part of the nation of Assyria. And Assyria was an enemy of the Israelites. They were considered to be international outlaws. They had plotted evil against the Lord. They were engaged in cruelty and exploitation, prostitution and witchcraft. They were lower than low. For Jonah, it was unthinkable that God would show people like these people, the Ninevites, compassion and mercy. It was very wrong for God to do this. At least that's what Jonah thought. And Jonah played the I knew it card. I knew it. I knew this would happen. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. In fact, what he saw happen in Nineveh with the people repenting was enough for Jonah to say, you know something? This would have justified me in the first place to go to Tarshish. I knew this was going to happen. And he knew it because preaching, even preaching about judgment, provides an opportunity for repentance and for mercy to be shown. And so, what does Jonah want to do? Jonah wants to die. You know, it would be better to die than to live and have to see that people like Nineveh, my enemies, have repented. That they've been shown compassion and mercy. Think about that for a moment. On the one hand, I've got to admire Jonah. You know, at least he was honest with God. He was honest about his feelings, and his emotions. Have you ever tried to hide your feelings and emotions from God? As if you really can. God knows them. On the other hand, God was big enough to handle Jonah's emotions. And that gives me hope. It gives me hope because it helps me to realize that God is big enough to handle my emotions as well. And so how do we feel when God's compassion is showed toward those whom we consider our enemies? How do we feel when God's compassion is shown toward those people 
who seem to be on the other side of what we consider to be an important issue. God's compassion is for others and for us. And so in the midst of red-hot passion and red-hot anger, God provides a remedial object lesson for Jonah to drive home the point. Sometimes God just needs to do that for us, don't you think? That we need an object lesson so that we can really see what it is that we need to see. We need a private tutorial to help us to learn. I mean, that's what happens here. Notice the leafy plant, the worm, and the scorching east wind were all provided by God. Isn't it interesting to think back into chapter 1 and remember that the big fish was provided by the Lord? Same word. God is the one who provides. The leafy plant provided shade for Jonah. It eased his discomfort from the sun. He was pleased with that. That plant was a gift of God's compassion and God's mercy. The worm chewed on the plant. It withered. There was no longer any shade. Jonah, by the way, was not pleased about that. The scorching east wind was provided by God. That made it hot, and Jonah was hot in temperature and in emotion. We in South Texas know what it's like to be hot. But you see, everything had gone wrong for Jonah. He wanted to die. But God's point was clear in the object lesson that he gave to Jonah. God was in control, not only of the leafy plant, but of the worm and the scorching wind, and also compassion and mercy. Jonah was not in control. He benefited from the shade of the leafy plant, but he was not in control of it. Jonah was angry over things that he couldn't control, even petty things. Jonah was angry that God was a God that showed mercy and compassion. Jonah didn't want to get it. Jonah didn't want to acknowledge it. Jonah didn't want to buy the fact that God was compassionate and merciful. Jonah was, con was not content with what he saw. And Jonah wanted to take his ball and go home. He didn't want to deal with it. He didn't want to deal with the fact that God was compassionate and merciful. But what Jonah didn't realize was that it wasn't his ball. It's just God's ball. And it's one of compassion and mercy. And Jonah didn't want God to play fair with compassion and mercy. What about us? Object lesson or not, there are some times when I simply don't want to deal with God's compassion and mercy. Oh, it's all right if it's shown toward me. But if it's shown toward somebody else, I don't know. I, like Jonah, at times don't want to get it. I, like Jonah, at times don't want to acknowledge it. And I, like Jonah, at times don't want to buy it. But that is my issue, not God's. God is full of compassion and mercy. And God sometimes will give an object lesson to help me see things from a different perspective. How about you? I don't think I'm the only one that has experiences like that when God opens my eyes so that I can see beyond myself. Who is it in your life? Who is it in your life and your experience that you don't think is worthy of God's mercy and compassion? A family member or a friend? A colleague or a boss? A teacher or professor? Someone with a different socioeconomic group? 
someone from a different lifestyle, ethnicity, country, or religion? God's compassion is for others and for us. Sometimes in red-hot anger, we need a remedial object lesson so that we can find some relief. And relief in the truest sense of the word comes from God. It is offered to Jonah in the questions that God asks. In verses 4 and 9, a question is repeated. Is it right for you to be angry? God challenges Jonah's mindset. God challenges Jonah's attitude. And Jonah doesn't want to deal with it. Jonah would rather die. He would rather die than see his enemies respond to the compassion of God. And then in verse 11, the question changes focus a little bit where God asks Jonah about the fairness of showing compassion to people who need it. Look at the question. And should I not have concern for that great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals? What on earth does that mean? Well, the fact that people couldn't tell their right hand from their left simply meant that they didn't know how to get out of the trouble that they found themselves in. They were not able to make the right decisions. They needed help. They needed the relief that only could come from repentance in responding to God's compassion. And so Jonah was asked that question. And should I not have concern? But we're left hanging. We don't know how Jonah responded. The scriptures don't tell us. We don't know if Jonah ever got relief from his spiritual indigestion. But that question is still hanging out there. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also the animals. And should I not have concern? Old Testament scholar Doug Stewart says this, anyone who answers yes to that question got the point. Anyone who asks why is it important has not understood the message, and anyone who answers no has not believed it. So what do you say when God says, should I not be concerned? Relief only comes by understanding who God is. Do you remember that commercial a number of years ago for an antacid? How do you spell relief? R-O-L-A-I-D-S. Remember that? I'd like you to think about that for a moment. If we were able to look at that from a, in a spiritual context, in light of God's mercy, you might want to write this down. R, repent and find relief. O, open your eyes and allow God to extend your field of vision beyond yourself. L. Listen more than you speak. A. Acknowledge God's sovereignty over all of life with compassion and mercy. I. Intentionality must be a reality. That is, we need to be intentional in hungering and thirsting for who God is and what God wants to do. D, develop your core. Develop that gr core group of people around you who are willing to encourage you 
and ask you questions and challenge you and love you enough to tell you when you're wrong. And S, surrender to serve the Lord of all. God's compassion is for others and for us. God is true to his character. God is compassionate and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. And God will be true to his character. God may surprise us. God may have mercy on those who we think are not deserving of it. And then again, which one of us really deserves God's mercy? And you know something? God will have mercy on us in the midst of our response, even anger. God can and will provide relief from any spiritual indigestion that we may develop. Why? Because God's compassion is for others, and God's compassion is for us. May it be so. Amen.